got here is a <coughs> interpretation of a 1900s blacksmith shop. And Sheridan, <laughs> yeah, coal get to you. Uh, in Sheridan, within the corporation limits in 1900, it was four known blacksmith shops. Now that's not counting the shops outside the house and that people just worked at. That's working every day, making a living blacksmith shops. There was like seven in the county that we know. Of. And if you know more, please tell me. I'd like to know about it. Uh, primarily, the blacksmith shop made anything that you wanted that you needed. The reason there were so many shops in, the in this town during the 1900s, timber industry was big. They were coming in on trams, laying down track, using mules and whatever to pull out logs, so they had to have chains, drags, hooks, all different kinds of things. So these shops were working multi-man, more than, it was just, wasn't a one-man operation, there was a lot of people involved, and they were working daylight to dark. And there's nothing romantic about being blacksmith. It's dirty, hard, burning work. Those guys did it the same as men work today. They did it to feed their families and have a home. Now, within the blacksmith shop, there is important things, things that we have to have. The most important thing in here is this right here. Those it does the majority of the work for me. All I have to do is feed it, manage it, take care of it, and it will do the majority of the work for me. The brick structure is commonly referred to as a forge. Now, a lot of times you'll hear the whole building is called a forge. Sometimes it's called a smithy. Sometimes it's called a shop. Uh, just whatever you want to call it. The primary, the structure that holds the fire is the forge. Now what we're doing here, we've got coal burning, and what we're doing, we're putting more air in the bottom of it, which increases the heat of it. The next car during crime is this rascal right here. The amber. It's my workbench. Uh, it does, that's where I do my work. The anvil is a partner of mine. Because if we take a piece of iron and we let the fire do its work while we're talking about the anvil, it has a number of different pieces to it. Now, the reason that it's important to know the names of the anvil if you're working in a blacksmith shop is so that you'll know what the smith wants. Uh, there'd be helpers in here, there'd be young guys in here working and doing whatever. And if I said, I'm going to come to the horn, that would be a kid to do whatever I wanted to do. So the helper would come over pick up his sledgehammer, and we'd work on the horn. I'm bending something, I'm making something on the horn. The table. If I said I was going to come to the table, the man would know where I was going to come to. I'm going to do some punching, I'm going to do some chisel work, I'm going to do something that is not, I don't have to worry about running the edge of my tool or running my anvil. So this is, this is the table. This is the face. The whole face of the anvil is hardened so that you can work on it, beat on it, and it does hold up. Within the face, you've got the hardy hole. This takes a hardy, that's a hot cut. That holds my different tools. And then you have the pritchel hole. The pritchel hole is primarily in that anvil to knock a slug of metal out where you punch through something. In fact, what will knock out where this went through to make the rivet hole for this, this little slug of metal come out. And that was done right there. You've got the heel and the anvil, you've got the body, you've got the waist, and you've got the feet. So everything's got a name so that someone else will know what I'm intending on doing. A lot of times we get asked is, how hot can we get a piece of metal? You can get a piece of metal actually the point to where it wants to burn on its own. It's like a spark. Now 
Now, if you notice, when I do this, I'm only turning this rod one quarter of a turn. I don't have to turn it all the way around because my buddy the anvil is doing the work on the bottom that I'm doing on the top. Now, a lot of folks think this is a waste of time. This is not a waste of time. This is my thinking time. There's more thinking goes into blacksmithing than there is work. This piece of metal has got considerably longer, but it's changed from a round to a square. The reason it has to be square is I'm working with a flat, flat faced hammer, I'm working with a flat faced handle. So I can get octagon or hexagon or anything like that, but I've got to have a flat face to hit against. The only way I can do round is to use my hardy hole again and a bob swedge and a top swedge and a big strong helper, <laughs> and I can make that round. I'm not going to cut this all the way through. All I want to do is mark it good. If I cut it all the way through, it's going to hit that person right over there. <laughs> I wouldn't do that too. Even though I have. <laughs> two reasons to do that. One of them is fact and the other one is fiction. And I like the fiction one better. Yeah. I've noticed every blacksmith does it. There's a reason. And I'll tell you I'll tell you the I'll tell you the fiction one first. The lonely nail, what holds America together. Here. Catch it. I'm not good. <laughs> I wouldn't throw you a hot nail. <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah, and one thing I failed to mention, if you ever look at an old anvil when there's a square down here on each side, this is probably a wrought iron body. <clears throat> and what those are are tong holes because whenever they welded a steel face on the anvil is obviously upside down. They put the steel into one forge, they put the anvil into another forge and they bring them up to welding temperature, set them down, put them together roll them over and take and set the, the weld to the hammer. Um, mm -hmm. So I had some folks ask well how you tell what's an old anvil? Uh, if it's not a square anvil, chances are it's an anvil before the 